Hello, hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening if you are in Asia. Uh, like myself, this is Lucas Kofi, the project manager of the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. Welcome, uh, new friends, old friends. Uh, today, uh, we are going to talk about, uh, of course, technology transfer and in specifically IP fundamentals for startups and SMEs, how to leverage your IP portfolio for funding and growth. And we are going to talk about this with uh, an old friend, with uh, Ms. Efrat Kaznik. I will give you in a, a second a short bio about Efrat. But before doing that, let me just take care about a, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. The first slide that you see here, you see uh, my email if you want to be in touch with me. The website of the help desk, still the link that is active for next year, fiscal year, about the survey that is where we are running about uh, SMEs and their interest about technology transfer operations. And of course, the link to the newsletter uh, that I really uh, suggest you to uh, register to so that you can get updates from the help desk. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Efrat. Mrs. Kaznik is the founder and president of Foresight Evaluation Group, Silicon Valley based IP valuation and strategy consulting firm specializing in helping companies bring innovation to market through the valuation, management, commercialization of their IP and technology. She's an appointed lecturer at the Stanford Graduate Business. Uh, school and teaching an MBA class on IP management as well as the Stanford Law School and Mrs. Kasnick has over 20 years of experience as an IP valuation and strategy expert as well as a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, CFO, investor and advisor. She serves as the chair elect of the high tech sector of the Licensing Executive Society or LES USA Canada as well as a board member of the LES uh, Silicon Valley chapter. Mrs. Kaznick has been listed on the IAM 300 list of world's leading IP strategists every year since 2013. She's a frequent speaker and contributor at IP and business conferences and publications, and I would also add at webinars like today. So without further ado, welcome back, Efrat. Uh, I would leave the floor to you, and uh, thanks again for being with us. Thank you, Luca. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Just doing a quick sound check. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for spending your Friday afternoon with me. I appreciate that. Um, uh, at, in my um, office at Stanford University um, at the heart of Silicon Valley, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Again, this is the second webinar that I'm giving. And uh, thank you, uh, Eva and Luca, for inviting me again. Uh, through the EU Japan uh, Center to give this webinar. Uh, I'll keep my comments to about 40, 45 minutes and leave enough room for questions. I see that we have a small group, so it should be, um, we should have plenty of time for your questions uh, as, as we go along. So the topic of today, um, just actually before we go into that, just a few words about myself. Uh, Luca has actually covered uh, almost everything. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, Bringing innovation to market has been my uh, life mission, uh, and everything that I do uh, revolves around that. Uh, the consulting that we do at Foresight, my teaching at the Stanford Business School and the Stanford Law School, the activities at LES, uh, I'm the incoming chair of the high-tech sector of LES USA Canada, for those of you who are active at LES. On the startup side, I myself have been an entrepreneur. I've been a co-founder, a CFO, I'm currently an advisor to several accelerators and um, investment organizations as well as startups around the world. And as, as Luca mentioned, I like to share the knowledge and I like to do these kind of webinars like we're doing today. And hopefully you would gain some um, useful insights from my, from my talk today and uh, you, something that you can carry into your work uh, in the future as you, as you work on bringing innovation to market, which is why we are all here today. So uh, really the outline for our webinar really follows a lot of questions that we're getting from entrepreneurs. And I like to approach the topic of IP and funding and startup valuations, which is the topics that we bring together in today's webinar in uh, looking look at it from two different ways. 
So the first question that we usually get from startups uh, that I get from people that I advise or we get here in the business is, how does AP bring value to a startup? How do you even think about, in the context of startup valuation, how does IP, the, the intellectual property, bring value to the startup? The second question that I would like to discuss today is, how do investors look at IP? Which is kind of a different question, different but related. So what startups need to remember is, at the end of the day, you're asking an investor to invest money in your company. They need to understand the value of your company. In that, they need to understand the value of the IP, which is a big value driver in any startup. So how do these two come together? Um, and then I would like to conclude um, the third part of my talk today with a case study that uh, follows a study that we did uh, looking at the valuation of unicorns. Unicorns are startups with a valuation of over a billion dollars. It's a very interesting case in how IP plays into that and what unicorns are doing or not doing to build an IP portfolio. And it's a nice way to bring all the concepts together. And then we'll end up with the key takeaways and leave some room for questions. So hopefully you will enjoy today's uh, webinar and we'll go right into it. So the first topic that I would like to discuss, the first part of my, web, my, of my talk today, is how does IP bring value to a startup? And this is an important question and any company looking uh, to leverage their IP for funding, um, whether it's a startup, whether it's a university, um, anybody who looks at bringing innovation to market. And I would like to uh, first uh, start with the, the words of one of the largest inv inventors, um, Thomas Edison, who is a prolific U.S. inventor, inventor of the light bulb and other many, many patents under his name. And uh, I like to start with this quote when I talk about IP and value because it really captures some of the problematic nature of looking at intellectual property and valuation together. So as uh, Mr. Edison smartly said, most inventors have an idea, but they never stop to think about whether the invention will be sellable uh, and how do they actually uh, make money out of it. And also in the, in the lower quote, um, he mentions the bump of practicality, the sense of the business. So the sense of the business is really important, and uh, we will talk uh, today really about how does IP bring value. So assuming that you have a good and valid idea, how can you actually leverage this idea for funding and valuation? Before we go into uh, the nuts and bolts of my talk today, I, I wanted to start with some really high level legal definitions. And I should mention here that those definitions follow US law. I know that we have um, actually no U.S. companies at all because this uh, webinar is open to European and Japanese companies, but uh, um, some of the concepts are universal. Some of them, there, there's minor tweaks. Uh, this, this is not a legal talk, so I just want to lay the foundation because I am going to talk about patents separately from trademarks especially, so I wanted to make sure that we have all the vocabulary right. So when we talk about IP rights, from a legal perspective, there's really four types. Uh, copyrights uh, are associated with uh, original works of authorship. Uh, more specifically, when I'm going to talk about copyrights, I'm going to talk about copyrights in the context of uh, software, which is um, for, for a technology company, this is where we see copyrights the most. Um, trademarks are related to um, more of the marketing or the brand of the product, the word, the name, a symbol. Um, they need to be registered. They, they don't have to be registered, but they, they could be registered with, with the, in the U.S. with the USPTO. Um, there's no expiration as long as they are used commercially. And as we will discuss later in the talk, trademarks are specifically important in consumer-facing products. Uh, the next two, trade secrets and patents, in my mind, is what I refer to as technology IP. And those kind of go hand in hand. There's an interesting trade-off between them. We will touch on that later in the talk, but just for the sake of definition, uh, when we talk about trade secrets, we talk about information that is kept secret and drives its value from being kept secret. There are two, term, two 
two conditions to having a trade secret. It needs to have economic value and it needs to be kept confidential. Uh, and the last one is um, patents. Um, and as uh, I believe most people probably on the call today know, um, patents represent an exclusionary right and have a life of, in most jurisdictions, 20 years from filing. Um, there's a lot of, that goes into patent, a lot of case law. They get litigated a lot. They bring a lot of value to companies. It's probably what I like to call the most tangible of all the intangible assets. Um, in the context of funding and valuation, we will talk a lot about patents. They have a key role um, in that. So moving on from the definitions, uh, just to illustrate that really uh, IP assets in, in most of the products today uh, that are complex or that technology products, uh, you really see all types of IP. So let's take Tesla as an example, a company that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, copy, styling of copyrights, uh, the company obviously has, has software and that that goes with copyright protection. They might have other um, works of authorship related to the company. Um, the company also has a strong, um, a, a large patent portfolio. They are doing interesting things with their patents, which we're not going to get into today, but uh, they do have patents. A lot of them read on battery technology, for example. As far as trademarks, the company has a very strong brand, probably uh, one of the strongest in the car industry that's protected by trademarks. And really everything else, manufacturing technology, all other kinds of things that are not part of the other three are included in trade secrets. So that, that's really how we think about it. And um, I should mention here that most startups uh, at, at the very early stage, all they have is trade secrets, really. They have a trade secrets and uh, there's a lot of um, movement in that area. And uh, it's a really important asset for startups, especially in the early stage. Moving on to my next slide. So what I would like to do now is I would like to overlay some of that IP on the funding cycle. So what I presented here, this is a fairly older slide, but it, it's probably one of the most accurate ones that I've seen. So I like to use it in my presentation. What this slide is showing is it's showing the funding cycle of a typical startup. And there are really three stages that are interesting to mention. One is what we call the seed stage. And this is a very early stage, uh, pre-market, pre-product. Uh, you see the word value of death, which refers to the difficulty to emerge from this stage into the next stage. The next one is, and that's really where we're going to focus um, uh, a lot of the talk today is uh, the, the part of the funding cycle where you can start approaching uh, VCs and other what we call institutional investors. And there's an early stage and a later stage. And these refer to, and you'll see the one, two, three, which today is, we actually call them ABC. But what the meaning of that is that a company has crossed an inflection point, which is right here and is now ready for more bigger and more uh, structured funding. And this is really where you see intellectual property, uh, that the companies really have some intellectual property that they have created here, that they can actually leverage for funding. The last stage is the pre-IPO stage, which is where you really see intellectual property become very important. And we're going to talk about unicorns. And you'll see that a lot of them don't have enough IP. When I talk about IP, I talk about patents and IP rights or so the protection on their own technology. And that is where you really you see a lot of companies filling in the gap uh, as they are getting ready to either get acquired or get go public or go into some sort of an, what we call an exit. So these are kind of the three stages in the life cycle of a startup. And uh, we will try to overlay the IP strategy and the IP value strategy on top of that. OK, moving on to my next slide. Uh, how do we leverage IP for startup value and funding? So how do we think about that? So I would like to use this really, really simple rule that I would keep as a, repeating as a mantra throughout my talk today. The right asset for the right industry at the right time. So when we talk about assets, 
there's um, the IP types that we're talking about are, let's say, for example, let's say patents, trademarks, and trade secrets. The next thing is the industry. So some industries have um, different uses for IP and, and different importance for different types of IP that, that create value. Uh, for example, I, I put here software, medical devices, and clean tech. So three very different industries. And lastly, uh, when I talk about time, I talk about um, really the funding stage. And that's why I showed you the previous slide. So there is a seed funding, a series A, B, which I called kind of the middle stage, and the pre-exit. Now, if you, if you look at that, you can draw any trajectory that you want. Uh, but really, the idea to keep in mind here, for example, is that, let's say, trade, let's say trade secrets are really important for all of these, really at all different stages, OK? But when you talk about patents, as we see in a minute, uh, patents are less important for software in the early stage, um, are more important for medical device and clean tech companies, for example, that are more R&D intensive uh, pretty early on from the seed stage and on, okay? Um, other examples are uh, trademarks. So trademarks might be important for a medical device company if they are consumer facing, uh, might be less important for a software company if they're not selling directly to the consumer. So you can, you can play with that, and you can, uh, you can kind of get an idea. And, and this is, I find this is a useful framework to keep in mind when you think about how IP brings value to a startup. And we'll, uh, we'll take a few examples of that so we can uh, get the concept um, illustrated. So for example, when we talk about uh, patents, OK, so I, I would like to focus uh, on patents and then on trade secrets of, of the assets that I showed on, on the slide. So when we talk about patents, um, as probably um, the callers on the call know, there's utility patents, which, which cover the, the process and the method. Um, and then there's uh, design patents, which cover the design of the product. Uh, so, you, so for example, when you talk about the importance of patents, utility patents are critical for companies in R&D intensive industries like pharma, clean tech, biotech, right? You invest a lot in R&D. You usually file immediately for protection. Anybody looking to fund you is going to look for patents. Design patents are less important. The reason I put that in there is I always bring this example of a company that came to us that is a startup. Um, and they came to us and they say, oh, we have a really large IP portfolio. And they, they made some sort of a wearable product. Turned out that those were all design patents. They had 70 design patents in all jurisdictions that you can think about. The problem is that those really, uh, you don't need 70 of those and, and no utility patents. So, so even patents, you kind of have to think about what is the right patent for the right product that I'm creating. When we talk about patents, it's important to remember because we see so many software companies getting funded, venture capital especially, and, and, and is mostly software investment. Um, Patents are not as critical for software companies looking for early stage funding. At the early stage, uh, or in, even in the um, later stage, what's important for a software company to keep moving down the funding cycle is really having users. Now, that doesn't mean that software companies don't need to worry about patents. They just need to worry about patents. Uh, they need to start building their patent portfolio so when they get to a uh, in pre-IPO uh, stage, they have enough IP, or if they want to enter a new market, they have enough IP so they could do that. So that's why I started with the phrase that says the right asset for the right industry at the right time. So that's uh, as far as patents. Uh, this is one example of a um, client that we had that leveraged patents uh, in the clean tech industry uh, to raise a Series uh, A, actually a pretty large Series A funding. Now, this is a client that we had a few years ago, a company called Nautilus. And what they did was a, uh, a floating data center. So this is like a, a, the data center on a boat using the water for cooling. So a company like that needs a lot of funding. So what they need to buy, they, they, used, they bought like surplus boats from the Navy. So they needed like millions of dollars uh, 
just to get started. But they developed the technology uh, using seed funding. So when they got to the point where they needed a Series A of $25 million, they had a fairly large patent portfolio of about 50 patents uh, across across the world, and they also had some software to go with that, as the, as well as a working prototype. So you kind of need the whole package to leverage for something like that. Okay, so uh, that that's that's just one example of how you can leverage uh, IP for funding uh, at, in the in the later stage uh, for Series A when you have built enough IP that you can leverage. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about trade secrets. Uh, now, trade secrets are critical to all startups, as, as I mentioned initially, particularly in the early stage. Trade secrets, there's an interesting trade-off between trade secrets and patents. So a lot of companies are, uh, when I hear is, uh, especially if they don't come from an R&D intensive industry where it's it's a no-brainer that you file for a patent. Uh, some companies just um, are, are worried about disclosing their secret to the world and all of that. Um, but what we, what's really important to understand is these are two types of protection, and each of them has its, its you know, pros and cons. Uh, we're looking at the 20-year protection for a patent versus a lifetime protection for a trade secret, as long as you can keep it secret. Uh, but really, the trade-off is one of protection. So patents require registration and examination, but in return, you get a very strong protection that uh, is much stronger than, in terms of being able to enforce uh, your rights, much stronger than a trade secret would give you. And now, it's difficult to directly value trade secrets. So when somebody comes and says, you know, oh, we have a trade secret, we have a technology, um, Let's value that. Uh, for funding, uh, it's not that it's impossible to value, but it's a little more difficult to leverage your funding. Because when you leverage your funding, and we'll talk about the types of investors in a minute, but investors usually, usually look for rights that they can see, like uh, patents or trademarks or things that, that, that are ascertainable, so you do your due diligence. Uh, it's, it's, much more, it's much easier to validate a patent it's more difficult to validate a trade secret. But what's interesting about trade secrets is that they are, while it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's more difficult to say how they add to value, it's very easy to see how they can impair your value. Because once trade secrets are misappropriated, that's the legal term for when somebody steals your ideas, uh, and by the way, trade secrets can only be enforced in court if you show direct misappropriation. So unlike a patent, the patent is out there. So anybody who infringes on your patent is assumed to have known about the existence of your patent. That's why it's a much stronger protection. Not so with trade secrets. With trade secrets, you have to show a theft. You have to show that somebody actually came and took your trade secrets, and you had they had access to it, and they took it away from you. Now, the interesting thing about trade secrets is that um, there's, we see a rise in litigation of trade secrets. The reason for that is there's a lot of workforce mobility. Really, trade secrets move with people. So these are, this is the stuff that is either in people's heads or is in files that people take with them. So you see a lot of litigation between startups, between startups and, and other companies. Uh, but there's tr stronger, stronger trademark laws uh, coming up in the U.S. as well as in Europe. So that's, that's a piece of good news. The U.S. Uh, one has already been enacted, so now it's a... Uh, there's a federal law for trade secrets. You can you can you can enforce them in federal courts more easily, and um, I, as I understand, there's more leg legislation coming in Europe as well. So that's good news for companies that rely on trade secrets. But really, it, it's interesting to think about trade secrets is they can really take away from your valuation. Um, and I always bring this uh, slide, and this is a quote from. Um, uh, Travis Kalanick, uh, the now ousted CEO of Uber, and uh, one of the largest trade secret litigation that we had uh, in recent years was the, uh, actually just now, this, this year, is the one between Waymo and Uber. Waymo is the subsidiary of Google that develops autonomous vehicles, and a few people from Waymo moved into Uber, took a few trade secrets with them, thousands of files and other people and knowledge, and... 
Uh, the quote here is really uh, indicative of the what I I would characterize as the misconception about trade secrets. Uh, when Travis Kalanick is reported to have told Larry Page, your people are not your IP, that to me represents kind of a misunderstanding of really what trade secrets are. Because trade secrets um, are in, at the heads of people. <laughs> so uh, startups really need to make sure that they protect their trade secrets because from a valuation perspective, this is one of the most uh, valuable assets that you have in the early stage. Okay, so we have talked about uh, question number one, which is how does IP bring value to a startup? And we uh, demonstrated the concept of the right assets for the right industry at the right time. Moving on, I would like to demonstrate uh, at least our model that we have developed here of how investors view IP and how does IP bring value to investors? So my next slide, uh, this is a, a screenshot from an article that I've written uh, to IPEG, which is a European IP blog, and I uh, am happy to share this link with anyone who wants to read the full article. So as you can see from the title of that, Intellectual Property Value in Startup Investments, A View from Silicon Valley, uh, what we did here is look at the investor's point of view. So what we talked about until now is how does a startup uh, structure its assets to bring value? Now let's look about how investors look at IP um, and how they, or how they should look at IP when they invest in a company. So I would like to uh, introduce this two by two matrix that I have here. Uh, you'll see uh, on the uh, horizontal axis, you'll see debt and equity, two different types of investment. Debt is a loan. So if you, when you lend money to a company, uh, the return that you have is interest. So you are not participating in the growth of the company. However, what you also get to do usually is you get to put, put a lien on the assets of the company. Uh, a lot of the assets of the company in, in the early stage or in later stages is their intellectual property. So uh, we see IP getting collateralized uh, against debt. So that, that is why I bring debt here as opposed to equity. Equity investors get to participate in the growth of the company. So their return is really the increase in value of the company. As a debt invent investor, you do not participate in the growth of the company. So if the company grows in value from 100 million to 200 million, you still get the same interest on your loan. Okay, so that's really important to understand. On the vertical axis, you'll see institutional and strategic. So when I talk about institutional investors, I talk about banks, I talk about venture capital funds, talk about financial investors. So these are institutions that are in the business of investing. Okay. When I talk about strategic investors, I talk about corporations. So I talk about venture arms of corporations. Uh, or a company investing directly or through a venture arm in a startup. And you see a lot of that coming up. Um, we'll we have a special slide about that coming up, but there's a lot of activity in the venture arm area. And uh, a company can also be a debt, can be a lender, uh, but uh, can also be an equity investor. Now, if you look at this quadrant, so now we've introduced the players and the types of investments. If you think about each of these four possible combinations, each of these types of investors gets a different kind of value from the intellectual property of the companies they invest in. And I will expand in the next slide about each of these. When we talk about institutional debt, we talk about liquidation value. Uh, when we talk about equity investment, we talk about the growth pivot value, which is very, very important to understand. So I'll, I'll spend some time on that. Um, also, when we talk about strategic investors um, investing as equity investors, we talk about synergy, because now you invested in a company that has some of their own IP. And um, the strategic debt, we're going to talk about monetization value. So it, it's really important for you as a startup, when you're trying to leverage your IP for funding, to get in the head of the investor and to really understand how they extract value from your IP as an investor. So that's really the, the purpose of this, this part of the talk. 
Um, I'm going to start with this quadrant, so I'm going to go into the equity side first, and then I'm going to talk about debt, which is less common and therefore less important for our purposes today. So when we talk about equity investors, and let's talk about venture capital funds, um, I'm, I introduced the concept of pivot value. So when I talk about pivot, what do I talk about? The pivot is the ability to change. Okay, if you, it, it's taken from the world of sports, but you know, it's, it's kind of a universal uh, term. It's one that's very common in Silicon Valley. So it's really important to understand that most startups actually fail. Okay, that's kind of a known truism. I'm not telling you something that you don't know. It wouldn't be a high risk investment if it, that wasn't the case. Since most startups fail, um, it's really important for IP to be able to support something that is broader than just the product that you started with, okay? So for IP to be useful, it needs to be broader than just the current product. VC investors need to ask themselves, can IP be leveraged to multiple products? So that's the pivot value. So um, software is easier to pivot. So if you, all you have is software, you can change the code. That's not very difficult. But patents are not that easy to pivot. So if your claims are not written broadly enough and in, in, in a thoughtful way, then you find yourself with a very narrow patent that might be easy to issue, but at the end of the day, doesn't bring you a lot of value. So that's a really, really important concept. Now, most VCs are completely unaware of that. So there's a lot of uh, misconception and ignorance um, when you talk to VC investors about uh, anything other than the limited defensive value of IP. So it's really important if you are pitching your company to a VC to stress on that your IP, if you, are, if you have a broad IP portfolio that can that have a good pivot value, you can use the word pivot, you can use some other word, uh, to, to, to really understand that uh, they're in for the long haul. So they are there to see you grow. If you don't have a if your IP is not versatile enough, you won't be able to grow. You'll, you'll be stuck and you'll, be, you'll start filing and you'll be chasing your new product at a point where you could actually have just have um, done a better job early on of filing a broader patent. So that's really important to understand. The next kind of value I would like to touch on is the, for the strategic investors, uh, equity investors, and that's the corporate venture. So I mentioned that early on. And that's what I call the synergistic value. Now, uh, so corporate venture activity has been growing, as I mentioned. You see most of the Fortune 100 firms in the US or worldwide have, have venture arms. So companies like Intel, Qualcomm, uh, any large technology company you can think about has a venture arm. Uh, now, why do they do that? Uh, because I think, as we all know, uh, it's, it's hard to innovate at the pace of the market when you are a large company. So it's a very common way for larger organizations to have, uh, to keep like a, a, a toe in the water, so to speak, and, and uh, hedge their development by investing in startups. So that's an activity, for example, in 2016, we've seen 25 billion over 1,300 deals, which is a big jump from previous years. Now, the ability to attract strategic investors and buyers, so the, the interesting thing about the corporate investor is that can also be your potential buyer. So it's not just an investor, it's also a potential buyer. Is the corporate venture groups have ties to the uh, investing corporation, so that's important for you. Um, it's also important to remember that they can provide potential synergies to you. And synergies don't just go into acquiring you, but it's also access to distribution, access to uh, sales channels, things that can really help you grow your product. And this is something that a VC doesn't, doesn't have the ability to provide. Okay, so that's the big difference between having corporate venture invest in you and having venture capital invest in you. In an M&A deal, uh, it's really important so that there's a synergy with the business. And, and, and usually a synergy brings more value. That's the definition of a synergy. One plus one equals three, right? That's synergy. So the more um, uh, intellectual property you have of your own it has value at the hands of the buyer by the fact that they can lump it together with their own IP. And now the value of the two portfolios combined is much larger than the value of the pieces. So that's, that's the interesting um, observation about corporate venture. 
So that's why I'm talking about synergistic value. Um, so that's just um, the two types of equity uh, investors and the value that it brings to them. Now let's talk about debt funding a little bit. Uh, debt funding, if you remember the, um, the chart that I showed you at the beginning, really comes in the early stage. Uh, the company needs to have more cash flow because debt really depends on your ability to monthly pay interest. So you need to have positive cash flows for that. And you can offer your IP as a collateral. So, you know, the, the better IP you have, the better your ability to collateralize the loan. But really, it's really important to remember that you need a corporate, you need a positive cash flow. So you need to, to be profitable in most cases to be able to take a loan. Otherwise, how are you going to pay it back? So we talked about two types of debt funding, uh, one coming from institutional investor, which is the more common one, which would be banks pretty much. Uh, those type of investors, when they look at your intellectual property, all they see is liquidation value. They couldn't care less about your pivot value because they're not there to see you grow. What they care about is should you default on your loan, can they sell the assets and get some of their money back? Okay, so liquidation value, you see that a lot in bankruptcy. And now bankruptcy really happens at the, usually at the end of the life cycle but uh, can also happen, you know, at any point, or they could, uh, a lender can take over your assets at any point that they, you default on your loan, depending on how the, uh, the contract is written. Um, some of the mo more famous IP auctions are the Nortel deal and the Toys R Us auction that's going, oh, bankruptcy that's going on now. And these are two examples of companies that were able to sell intellectual property for a lot of money for Nortel hopefully a lot of money for Toys R Us. For a company like that, we're talking about um, a trade, uh, their, their trademarks and their brand, really. So what Toys R Us is trying to liquidate now are their brands. I don't know if you've been following the news, but um, they, they are actually in the process of, of liquidating their stores, but also in terms of intellectual property, uh, their brand. So that, that's an example of a consumer-facing uh, company that uh, the brand is the main IP, not so much technology. The other type of debt uh, investment, just to round this, this up, is uh, corporate loans. Uh, we don't see, as I mentioned, a lot of that. Uh, it's less common, but it's possible. Uh, if you have some strategic collaboration uh, as an add-on to an equity investment, you can see a line of credit, that, that, that debt. Um, the assets, uh, again, uh, if you default uh, on your blow, on, on your debt, then what a corporate lender can do is what I call a monetization value. So what they can do is they can combine your IP with their IP, um, and they can uh, more easily monetize your IP uh, if the goal is just to get a return on, on the on the on the loan. Um, but that that's as I mentioned is is, is a less common uh, occurrence. Okay, so we have addressed uh, the, the both points of view by now. We talked about how IP brings value to a startup. We also talked about the, the various type of, types of investors and their types of investment. So we discussed four types of value that IP brings to investors. And um, at this point, I would like to conclude, so I'm getting to the last part of my talk, and talk about a case study, which I think is fascinating. So this is, uh, you, you kind of bring it all together when you talk about unicorn valuation. And the question here is really, are IP positions and startup valuations correlated? Now, that is the question we started with and we embarked on a study a couple of years ago. And we studied unicorns, as I mentioned, are startups with a valuation of over a billion dollars, just because it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting kind of almost like a laboratory case. So you have like this, this startup with this huge valuation and uh, that they uh, are then they're still private. And the question is, uh, how did they get to this valuation? And did IP has anything to do with that? Okay, and, and if not, then why not? And what should, what are the risks of not having enough IP when you are a unicorn. And that kind of brings together all the concepts that we talked about today. So I, I thought it would be a nice uh, case study to conclude the talk with. So here's another, here, here's the cover of our study. And once again, I'm happy to share that with anyone who is interested in reading this article. 
I, we published it uh, with IP Watchdog, which is, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, a leading uh, IP blog uh, coming out of the US and a place that I publish a lot. Um, so as you can see the title here, it's kind of already giving you the answer. Uh, the naked truth, 30% of US unicorns have no patents. So let's dive a little deeper into this finding and see what does it mean and uh, is it a problem, what can they do, and how did we get there. So um, let's just introduce some of the unicorns. Uh, we use the Crunchbase uh, database, which is a, um, a if, you, if you're familiar with TechCrunch, it's a, it's a technology publication. They have a, a running tab of all the unicorns. Uh, they keep updating it every quarter. This, this was done in two, the last time we updated it was 2017. It doesn't really change much. Uh, but uh, you can see companies like Uber, Airbnb, Palantir, WeWork, see all the usual suspects that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, there, um, we only looked at the US subsection of that, which is 95 companies. Um, the median age is eight, so these are not companies that are brand new, but the companies that have been around, but not, not for a long time. Median funding is 286 million, so that's important to note. To become a unicorn, you usually need to raise a lot of money. And the median valuation is one and a half billion. Uh, so uh, it's also important to mention that uh, because some of the structure of how funding is done as you as you proceed in your funding round, you have to keep raising your valuation all the time, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing unicorns being born. Uh, another reason is that companies like to stay private longer, so VC exit cycles used to be three to five years. Now we're seeing companies staying in business eight years and longer. Um, and if you keep if you want to keep growing these companies and raising these kinds of money, the valuation needs to keep going up. So. Everything fits together. There's no miracle here. Uh, it's just uh, a sign of the times and a sign of the, fin the funding climate that these companies are working in. So let's look at their IP. So what we did was, uh, first of all, we looked at the make of the group. So the make of the group is, as expected, 38% software companies. And these are companies like Slack. Um, another 16% right here, this um, slice are consumer internet, and these are like the Ubers and Airbnbs of the world. And the other major uh, slice here, at close to 11%, are e-commerce companies, and those are companies like Living Social and others. So a lot of software companies, as you can see. Uh, not that many um, uh, energy, very little, hardware, very little. So these are kind of the typical industries where you see this kind of valuation. The next thing we looked at is we looked at their patent portfolio. We actually just did a count. So how many patents do these companies have? And what we found is this is the why you saw the title of the article is 30% of them have no patents. So as you know about patents, there's a lag between how much, uh, when you file it and when you see it. Uh, when we say no assets, we mean no pending applications that we can see. That, that usually comes out after 18 months, at least in the US. Um, and no issued patents. So no patents at all, 30%. Uh, one to five assets that includes patents and applications, 21%, and six to 10, 11%. So if you count these three together, you get 61%. So 61% of the group have a, what I would characterize as a very insignificant patent portfolio. And remember, these are companies with, with billions of dollars in valuation. So, um, what does that mean? Okay, so we can stop here and say you don't really need IP to grow your valuation of the evaluation of your company, which empirically speaking is is probably true for these companies. But what does that really mean? Okay, so when we look at the distribution, well, we see where's the gap. So when we look at the, where the gap is, we see that really there's uh, this is uh, it might be a little hard hard to see the name, but this is the consumer internet is where you have the most gap. So these are companies, like I mentioned, like Uber and Airbnb and companies like that, um, that account for 38%, almost 40% of the value, but have only 8% of the patent. Okay, so th this is where the distribution gap is the largest. Um, conversely, if you look at healthcare, 
um, you see that that's that, the, the purple segment. You see that these are companies that account for 17% of the patent distribution, but uh, only 8% of the value. So these are the sectors that are most mismatched, and everything else is kind of more aligned. So you can see it here. Uh, so this is the, the, the gap that I talked about. So if you look at consumer internet, uh, you see that these companies have very little patents, but very high valuation. So if I look at a table like that, I predict that, and we, we made this prediction as soon as we saw that about th almost three years ago, that this segment is going to have a problem because these companies are going to get to a point where you can grow your valuation, but at some point you have to start, you either enter a new market or you are going to approach an exit event and you are very, very vulnerable at that point. If you don't have enough patents, and as, as we know, patents don't just have a defensive value, but they also have all sorts of uh, strategic value, you might find yourself uh, in a problem. So what we're seeing is, interestingly enough, uh, is that uh, if we go back to uh, the chart that we showed at the beginning, and you remember I told you the right asset at the right time, Patents are not very important for these companies here, right? It didn't stop them from getting to a point of a unicorn here. But you get to this point, so this is the right time for them to start worrying right now, um, and they just they don't have a strong IP portfolio. So I, in terms of IP rights, it's not that they don't have technology, they don't have the right protection. And you, when you have a valuation over a billion dollars, you're very vulnerable if you don't have a strong patent portfolio. So what is happening with these companies? So we're seeing an interesting phenomenon that's called backfilling. So what we're seeing is we're seeing companies that are these large unicorn startups buying a lot of patents. And what they're buying patents um, with a priority date that is earlier, sometime earlier than their founding date, but definitely early. Because if, if you start issuing, if you start building a patent portfolio, it, it takes a few years and you'll be behind. So um, one thing that we're seeing, uh, just as an example, is we're seeing them buying a lot of patents to fill in the gap. So if you look at these bars, you'll see the red um, part of the bar represents the portion of your portfolio that is inorganic, which means that this is something you have purchased from other people. And the blue part of your bar represents the organic part. So this is the patents that you filed and issued yourself. So as we can see, Facebook. Um, Twitter, Groupon, and LinkedIn. These are all companies that have acquired more patents than they actually uh, grew organically by their own filing. So that's a very interesting phenomenon, and, and it doesn't surprise me at all uh, seeing the gap. Between these, all, these, a lot of these companies are in the sectors of software and, and consumer uh, software that, that we saw that are, that are more vulnerable to that. And one specific example is Uber. So Uber has launched a what they call the Up3, which is a patent acquisition pro program where they're buying patents. Um, and one of their famous um, acquisitions that happened last year is they bought patents from AT&T. And now you might wonder, why would Uber buy patents from AT&T? Well, as it turns out, AT&T had some ride-sharing patents as well as other patents that um, this is a company that does a lot of R&D, so they have a lot of patents, not all of them they need. And so AT&T is now selling patents, and that acquisition gave Uber patents having priority dates predating Uber's formation, which is very interesting. Because that's the back feeling that I just showed you. So that was a, a great buy for, for Uber. Um, and you can see the IP that they got from AT&T covers various technologies related to messaging, call handling, routing, etc. All stuff that's really relevant for their business. And uh, finally, that deal was awarded the deal of distinction by LES. That's how come I know about it. I actually, um, as, as uh, chair of the high tech sector, I handed them the award. So they um, they were voted in as the deal of the of deal of the year in 2017. It was a really interesting deal, but the reason I'm highlighting this one is it shows you exactly the unicorn story that we just could see from the data. So we could see that coming, uh, but now we're seeing that in action. So Uber is a smart company. They have their, their, uh, the, the person that's doing the buying there is a guy by the name of Kurt Brash, and he used to be a Google guy, and Google did the same thing. Uh, 
a few years before that. So a lot of these tech companies go through this cycle where they get into a market, uh, they, they, that they're, they're getting large in valuation, they want to enter new markets, they need more patents. So that, that's something that you see in the market. Um, so that, that, was, uh, that concludes the last part of my talk. I would like to finish um, here with a few key takeaways, uh, managing IP for funding and growth. And th th this is really uh, the highlights of everything we discussed today. And then I'm going to open it to questions. So uh, key takeaway number one, leverage your IP strategically. So always remember that you should create the right mix of assets uh, for your industry and for the time of uh, funding or for your, the life cycle of your startup as, you, as you're going along the funding cycle. Uh, the next point is understand your investor's point of view. So always remember, you're asking for money. Uh, you need to understand the investor's point of view. This is a, th this is a recommendation I, I give to every startup that works, walks in the door here. Uh, and a lot of people get frustrated as why are investors not understanding us. Well, we have to also, also understand them. And so uh, have a pivot value, especially if you're looking for equity funding, and have a synergistic value if you're going for M&A. And lastly, think big. You can become a unicorn one day, too. So be prepared for growth and be prepared to enter new markets. And with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. I'm actually going to leave this slide up. Um, and I'm going to open it for questions now. Thank you, uh, Luca. And I'm passing it back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred. As usual, you've been uh, really, really clear. I will leave a couple of minutes, maybe to the uh, to the attendees to think about questions for you. Uh, in the meantime, I, I do have one, uh, as usual. Uh, so I, I would like to probably to start by asking you what is the main difference you see of any kind. Uh, when it comes to funding between Europe and, and the U.S.? I know that this is kind of a million-dollar question, but uh, probably all the, uh, the attendees are also interested in this. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Yeah, so what I see is more on... So we, we looked at two parts here. So on the startup side, uh, I, I don't see a lot of difference in terms of how startups uh, build their IP, build their technology. What I see a lot of differences I see on the funding side, uh, and specifically on the, the what I call the equity, um, the, the 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 institutional equity investment. So that that the understanding of uh, risk the risk taking profile is is lower in Europe. So you don't have the larger amounts that are needed to invest in a company to get it out of the seed stage and into uh, the exit stage. So this is kind of the, the, the big part in the middle that you need to go through in order to, 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 get, to get a company to an exit point. So, so that's what I see in Europe. I see uh, a lot of European startups uh, that, that we are advising that are, at, at some point, they, they have exhausted their funding ability in the US, in, in, in Europe, and they're coming to the US uh, to look for funding. So I see I see more of the difference with the investors, less so with the startups, uh, or or the, the the ability to grow. I don't see lack of innovation. I just see lack of funding, uh, or or the kind of funding that uh, can get you to the next level. So I I, I think these things are are improving. I, I know in Japan uh, we see uh, we see SoftBank and and funds like that emerging in Japan. A lot of them are investing uh, in the U.S., by the way, but um, hopefully some of that money will go into the local market as well. So I know we might have some Japanese callers um, on the call today. Um, so I think there's some hope in Japan, uh, and I'm looking for the next mega fund like, like a soft bank to emerge in Europe as well. Thank you, Efrat. Um for for your for your answer uh and it's true there is a lot of a lot of movement in uh, especially in, in asia and in japan as you as you mentioned uh i don't see here from the chat box any question as of now um so maybe there is someone e in tuscany uh let's see we might have actually a question <clears throat> 
Okay, I'm preparing one. Perfect. So, in the case, maybe I can probably uh, ask you something else. I had a couple of things in my in mind. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the concept of, of trade secrets, the, the nature. So, how, how would you recommend a startup to protect a trade secret so that it, it doesn't lose in, uh, value? And especially maybe considering, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the fact that a company might have, of course, operations even in, the, in multiple jurisdictions in different countries. Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, uh, that, that's a very important question. And, and protecting trade secrets is, is I would say, a, a long-lasting task that starts at the, the, the day you start sharing your idea with someone and goes all the way. And as we have seen, even the large Google is having trade secrets leak out, uh, especially nowadays when information is, is much more accessible and uh, data as well as people are more mobile. Um, so in the early days, uh, you know, we're seeing startups are really uh, lacking uh, even the, 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 the simple invention uh, assignment agreements and things like NDAs and things like that that um, are kind of the legal boundaries of your trade secret. So it's important to understand that while it, it, it might not be uh, able to, to block entirely the leak of trade secrets, if you don't have those in place, you don't have a trade secret. So what's important in the U.S., uh, if you get to co go to court to try to enforce a trade secret, you need to show that you have taken measures to keep it confidential. And if you don't have those agreements in place, then you don't have a trade secret from a legal perspective. So it's really important to, uh, even though it, it, it's tedious and it doesn't seem like it's really important, um, to always have NDAs in place when you share information and always have, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, I should, I should mention here, there's no legal advice, this is just practical, common sense business advice. Uh, that's one thing. But what I would also say is on the flip side of that is um, some startups that I see, get, you get to a point where you, um, you become overly cautious about sharing your idea. And, and uh, so investors, for example, are not going to sign uh, an NDA. Um, I, as a startup advisor, will not sign an NDA with you until I get engaged with you. So what startups need to also learn is how to capture your idea in a non-confidential way when you want to, to get feedback from people, which is really, really important, or you want to, to, to network your idea to make sure you get to the right investors. So these are kind of the two the two sides of the advice that I would give. And now I see the Clear. question that came in. There is a question probably it's better if you read it yourself because as you can see it's a little bit long. So probably you're faster. Okay. Okay, I will read it out loud. In in US companies and startups there is more awareness about the importance of IP as a value asset. I work in Italy, Tuscany with lots of startups and SMEs, and it is very difficult to let them understand this point. I'm not an IPR expert, but I'm trying to acknowledge myself. Can you give me some simple and starting tips to approach this issue with startups and help them to start investing in IP? Okay, so uh, I've given you uh, how, many, how many slides I have here. So there's a lot of information in the slides that we covered today, uh, but what I would like to um, when you talk to startups, and which I think, I, if I understand your question, and um, and you're trying to explain to them how to approach the issue of IP uh, and why they need to invest in IP, um, I would uh, I would follow the rule that I just gave you of you need to um, you need to work on the right asset at the right time at the right info for, for your industry um, as an example I can give that a lot of times a software company would say why do I need a patent so um, and it's not always the answer to that is not always because you're gonna gonna get more funding because really as a, as a software company what it determines your funding is your users but what I would say is that because so you don't find yourself in a position uh, as you grow, that, and, and you can give the unicorn example, that's why I show this example, uh, you might not become a billion dollar company, but even if you grow uh, 
to a point where you start facing competitors and you start uh, facing incumbents or you're trying to disrupt an industry, you get to a point where patents are important for you. And so, but the problem with patents, though, if you don't start today, you're not going to have a patent tomorrow. Uh, it, it takes three to four years to to, to build a, a decent beginning of a patent portfolio. So um, there's an element of time here too. And so you know, we do a lot of this education, um, and I always start with the story. So I, I, I talk about the unicorn just to show as an example of that your valuation can grow really, really quickly. Um, uh, and you grow it not using patents, but you will need patents at the end of the day, and you want to start early because it takes a while to build them. So that that's just one example. But you really need to, to kind of sit down with whoever the startup is and think about um, what is their intellectual property. So what is the technology? Um, are there any any uh, brand-related assets that are, are uh, require uh, growing and, and, and nurturing? Um, and then you, you figure out what is the right protection, and then you start today. So you and always have a plan. So if you don't have a plan, that's the worst thing. It, it doesn't have to be a perfect plan, and a lot of the resources are limited for a startup, and I'm I'm fully aware of that. Uh, but but not having a plan at all is 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 not is not good. So it's better have an imperfect plan than not having a plan at all as it relates to growing your IP portfolio um, for the later date. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Thanks, thanks, Efrad, for your your answer. Thanks for E and Tuscany for for the question, and he's also or she is also thanking you. Um, I don't see I don't see any other questions, so I would probably uh, conclude our talk today. I really hope that we can have you again uh, as a guest in a future in a future event. Uh, so I would like to thank you once again, Efrad, for being with us. Uh, all the attendees, of course, for being with with us again and uh, inviting you all to be with us again on June 29th for the next webinar on utility models. And also would like to, of course, uh, thank Eva in Brussels for the, for the help as usual.